I'm Megan. And I'm Nicole. And we're fifth year medical students from UCT. Today we're going to take you through the examination of the shoulder. But before we do that, let's revise some of our anatomy. The shoulder is made up of three different bones, the humerus, the clavicle, and the scapula. It also has four joints, the glenohumeral joint, above that the acromioclavicular joint, medial to that the sternoclavicular joint, and over the posterior aspect of the ribs, the scapulothoracic joint, which is a pseudo joint. The movement of the shoulder comes largely from the glenohumeral and the scapulothoracic joints. The main muscle groups of the shoulder are the rotator cuff muscles consisting of subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, and then we have the deltoids and the biceps muscle. So before you start a focused examination, remember to take a thorough history because this will point you to the diagnosis in most cases. Then moving on now to your examination. Megan? Before you start your examination, it's important to make sure that the patient is as exposed as possible so that you can see the whole shoulder properly. Then you want to start off by doing a quick screen of the joints above and the joint below. So with the shoulder, this means we'll check the neck and the elbow. The neck will screen by asking Nicole to flex it, putting her chin on her chest, to extend it, looking up at the ceiling, to turn that way, to turn this way, then to bend her head that way, bend it this way, and then finally we can do the spurnings test, which is where she turns her head to face me, extends it slightly, and then we press down gently. If this elicits any paresthesias or shooting pains, this indicates a neuropathy. Then, moving on to the elbow, I can't see any gross abnormality, so I'm going to move it by flexing it, extending, and then pronating and supinating. And that all looks good. It's also very important to do a neurovascular exam. So, I'm going to feel the radial pulse, which is present and normal, and then I'm going to do a quick neurological screen. So, checking for sensation over C5, C6 over the thumb, C7 over the middle finger, C8 over the third little finger, and then T1 along the anterior aspect of the arm. And that concludes our, our screening, so then we can move on to the focused exam. So the three components to any orthopedic examination is looking, feeling, and moving. So Megan, how are you going to go about looking at the shoulder joint? Well, Nicole, I'll start off by inspecting the skin overlying the joint. So I'm looking for any scars, which could be surgical or traumatic, any sinuses or redness, which might be an indication of an infection. I then want to take a look for any deformities. So we'll start systematically by looking over the SC joint. Any deformity here might be a sign of previous or current dislocation. Moving on to the AC joint, where a swelling may be a sign of previous dislocation or possible arthritis. Then looking at the glenohumeral joint itself, if I see um, loss of the rounding of the shoulder as well as anterior fullness, this may imply an anterior dislocation, while posterior fullness may imply a posterior dislocation of the humerus. If you can turn around for me, please. We're then going to take a look over the scapula. While we're here, we can also look for wasting, which is a very important sign. So over the scapula, I'll be looking for prominence of the spine, which may indicate wasting of the rotator cuff muscles. I can then look for wasting of the deltoids or any prominence of the biceps. I can also look under the axilla for any swellings or other abnormalities, which is a very important and often neglected area. So now moving on to the feeling part of our examination. So as you saw in the anatomy, the shoulder is made up of many components which we want to feel. So Megan, how are we going to go about this? Well Nicole, I'm going to start off by feeling for any discrepancies of the temperature of the, the overlying skin, which may be an indication of inflammation or infection. I then want to palpate over all the structures of the shoulder, feeling for any tenderness. So I'll start over the sternoclavicular joint, gently pressing for tenderness here, moving out along the clavicle and pressing over the AC joint. Pain here may indicate AC joint arthritis, which is fairly common among the older population. I then am going to press directly over the glenohumeral joint and then move down the length of the arm, feeling for deltoid tenderness, biceps tenderness, and I can just hook my fingers into the antecubital fossa there to check for any um, tendon rupture. If the long head of the biceps ruptures, you'll get something called the Popeye sign, which is where the, the biceps will bunch down here, um, lower down the arm. Having checked this side, I want to then check over the scapula. So if you can turn around for me, please. 
I'm going to feel over the spine, under the spine, and along the spine this process itself, as well as along the margin of the scapula for any tenderness. Again, remember, it's important to check under the axilla for any lymphadenopathy or other abnormalities. You're also able to feel the axillary artery here, which is good to check for the neurovascular status of the shoulder. So now moving on to the movement part of our examination. So as you saw in the anatomy, the shoulder joint is a very shallow ball and socket joint. And this gives it a great range of motion, however, makes it prone to instability, but we'll discuss that later. For now, let's look at the range of motion. In the arm, we're looking at flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, as, long as, as well as internal and external rotation. And when we're looking at the range of motion, we also want to talk about active and passive forms of motion. So active is when the patient moves on their own strength, and passive is when the examiner moves the patient's arm. What's the importance of this? Well, if you have active and passive limitations, we know that that points to an intra-articular problem. However, if your active is reduced and passive is normal, we know that this points to an extra-articular problem. So Megan, how are you going to go about assessing the movement of the arm? So when examining the range of movement, we'll start off by asking the patient to move actively. Only if there is a limitation of active movement will we go on to testing passive movement. So we'll start by asking Nicole to flex her arms, bringing them up and trying to put them by her ears. And that looks great. So you can bring them down. Then we'll ask Nicole to abduct her arms. Again, bringing them up as high as possible. The normal range of movement for that is between 150 and 180 degrees. Mid-arc pain indicates a rotator cuff or impingement syndrome problem. And pain at the end of the range of movement may indicate AC joint arthritis. We'll then ask Nicole to abduct her arm by bringing it across her body. And we can move on to asking her to almost wrap it around her neck. This is called the scarf sign, and pain over the AC joint during this movement indicates AC joint arthritis. We'll then ask Nicole to externally rotate her arms, so keeping her elbows by her side to bring them out like that, and then internal rotation, we'll ask her to try and touch as far up on her spine as possible. The normal range for this is between T4 and T8. So we can see that that looks good. We can also test external and internal rotation with the shoulders abducted to 90 degrees. So external rotation and then internal. And there we've seen the full range of movement of the shoulder. So now we're going to take a look at the specific muscles in the shoulder. And we're going to first start off with the rotator cuff muscles and then we'll move on to biceps and, and deltoid individually. So, we know that our rotator cuff muscles consist of four muscles, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So Megan, how are you going to assess these muscles? So when we assess the rotator cuffs, we're looking for pain, which can indicate a tendonitis, or weakness, which can indicate a rotator cuff tear. We'll start off by looking at subscapularis, and remind me, what's the function of that? Internal rotation, Megan, as well as adduction. All right, so we'll ask the patient place her hand behind her back, like so, and to try and push off against my hand. That looks good, and that's called the Gerber's lift-off test. But Megan, what if the patient can't do this? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Nicole. If the patient is unable to place their hand behind her back, you ask her to place her hand on her abdomen, and then to press against your hand like that, called the belly press test. Okay, then we'll move on to checking supraspinatus. The function? So it initiates abduction, Megan. All right, so we'll ask the patient to abduct her arm and internally rotate it with the thumb pointing down. And you also want it to be about 30 degrees forward in line with the scapular pain. I'll then ask you to keep it there while I try and push it down. And that looks nice and strong. Then we'll move on to testing infraspinatus, which externally rotates. So again, we'll ask Nicole to place her elbows by her body and keep it there, externally rotating it against resistance. Finally, we'll check teres minor. And the function? Also external rotation, Megan. All right, so this time we'll abduct the shoulders again and place them in external rotation against resistance. There's another sign that we can do, we can look for when checking for teres minor weakness, um, is to ask the patient to put her hand up to her mouth. 
This usually requires some degree of external rotation, and so if it is weak, the patient will compensate by lifting up the, the elbow, looking like a hornblower. And that concludes the rotative cuff examination. Moving on to examining the other muscles, we'll start off with the deltoid, whose function is? Abduction, Megan. All right, so we're going to abduct against resistance there. But Megan, what if the patient can't do that? <laughs> Good point, I almost forgot. So, if the patient is in too much pain, for example with a shoulder dislocation, you can simply place your fingers over the deltoid and ask them to move as much as possible. And even the slightest flicker of movement will be palpable. And this also shows that the axillary nerve is intact. It does, and you can also confirm this by checking that the sensory patch over the shoulder is intact. Alright, then we're going to take a look at the biceps, which we can test using the speed test. Asking Nicole to bring her arms up in front of her against resistance. That looks good. And then the yoga sense test, where we place our elbows against the body and supinate against resistance. So, all right, and that looks nice and strong. So that concludes testing for the muscles of the shoulders. So now we're going to take a look at impingement. And when we speak about impingement, we are talking about the tendons that seem to be compressed upon bony prominences within the shoulder. And most commonly, this is supraspinatus against your acromion. So Megan, how are you going to test for this? Okay, so when testing for impingement, we're going to bring the arm into the same position as if we were testing for supraspinatus, just like so. And then we're going to stabilize the scapula against the chest, thereby removing that element of the shoulder's movement. Then I'm going to bring the arm up like so, which attempts to knock the greater tubercle of the, of the humerus against the acromion, thereby replicating that pain. And is that painful, Nicole? No, Doctor. <laughs> Remember, you always want to look at the patient's face to see if you're eliciting any pain. So we can see that if there is pain on this movement, it's called a positive Nears sign. However, there's also something called a Nears test, which is where you inject local anesthetic into the subacromial space. And then, when you repeat the test, if the pain is gone, this is a positive Nears test. The other way that you can test for impingement is something called the Hawkins sign. So we'll abduct the shoulder and then stabilizing it again, bring it down like so, checking for any pain. And that concludes testing for impingement. So now we're gonna take a look at instability. So as you already know, the shoulder is a very shallow ball and socket joint. And because of this, it is prone to instability and dislocation, with anterior dislocation being the most common. So Megan, how are you going to go about testing for instability? So in order to test for this, we're going to bring the arm into its most unstable position, which is where we abduct it, have the elbow bent, and we externally rotate it. We're then going to externally rotate it further to see if the patient complains of any apprehension, feeling like the joint is about to give way or pop out. So we'll externally rotate it like so. And if the patient is feeling apprehensive, we can relieve this by supporting the front of the joint. We can then test for instability by checking for the sulcus line. So we'll apply downward traction and checking for the appearance of the sulcus below the acromion. And once you finish checking for instability, you basically finish examining the shoulder. Thank you for watching our video and all the best for your shoulder examination and with the exams to come. Thank you.